Conflict resolution. When we read and look through the scriptures, when we walk through the gospels, we see over and over again, time and time again, conflict that arose whenever Jesus showed up in a place. Wherever he went and whatever he said and whatever he did, there were always people who were pushing back, who were opposing him, who were trying to stop him. We know that the people there, when they heard what he had to say, they were amazed. We read that passage over and over again. It says that they were astonished at, about what he was talking about and what he was saying. But regardless, in every setting, in every situation, there were always people that were trying to shut him down. Nothing's changed. People are still trying to shut him down. They're tr still trying to shut down the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so over the next few weeks, we're going to be talking about from the book of John, like some of those moments and, and some of the deeper meanings that we can find as it relates to those conflict moments. And so in John chapter 2, the first one we're going to spend some time talking about here today is basically, I've entitled this sermon, Cleaning the House. And so this is the moment that we read about in John chapter 2 where Jesus comes into the temple. He arrives at the temple there, the temple of God in Jerusalem, and, and it's in the Passover season, the Passover time, the, the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, where they celebrated their, the Israeli, uh, when they came out from Egypt, when they were rescued from Egypt. And so it's one of the highest and the holiest days in the Jewish calendar. Every single year it happens around in April where they celebrate Passover. And this was the season that we read about here today that Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And when he arrived in Jerusalem, it was the Passover season when people from all over the nation were coming, arriving at the temple for a time of worship, for a time of celebration of what God has done, for a holy time where sacrifices would be offered to God, uh, sacrifices that would be for their sins, sacrifices for experiencing the presence of God. And so people would travel from far and wide to come and to be there for that moment, to, to be there for that special, special time when, when they would actually encounter this God that had delivered them so many years ago. But as we read about it in John chapter 2, and by the way, uh, there are recordings of the cleansing of the temple all throughout the Gospels in Matthew chapter 21, in Mark chapter 11, in Luke chapter 19, all record this moment. Now, there are some differences of opinion of whether Jesus cleansed the temple twice or whether he only did it once because the book of John records it that it was towards the beginning of his ministry where all of the other three gospels, the synoptic gospels, talk about it being towards the end of his ministry. And I've got to be honest with you, I I'm not like completely sure. I kind of have the idea that John, because his book was written like totally different than all of the other books that were written, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, I kind of had this understanding, I kind of had this thinking that, that perhaps John didn't write it in a chronological way, but he wrote it in the sense of, of how it all fit together because John's gospel is very clearly pointed at the gospel of Jesus Christ, the purpose of Christ's work, and it was less of a historical accounting of all that Jesus did. So I think there was only one. Some you know, theologians, good theologians, think there were two. Regardless, it happened. Okay, whether one or whether two, it doesn't really matter. But today we're going to read about this account from John chapter 2. And so let's read together. We're going to begin with verse 13. And in verse 13 of John chapter 2, uh, it says this. The Jewish Passover was near. And as the Jewish Passover was near, I lost my place here. Sorry about that. I turned the page and, and everything went, went south on me here. Ah, oh, that's why. Because I'm looking in the book of Mark. And that won't work, will it? We're going to have to go back to John. I just told you, we're going to be in the book of John. And I turned to Mark. Great, great pastor you chose. I'm just telling you. Okay. John 2, verse 13. The Jewish Passover was near, and so Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling oxen and sheep and doves. And they also, he also found the money changers sitting there. After making a whip out of cords, he drove everyone out of the temple with their sheep and oxen. He also poured out the money changers' coins. He... Uh, he told those who were selling doves, get these things out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a marketplace. And his disciples remembered what is written, uh, zeal for your house will consume me. So the Jews replied to him, what sign will you show us for doing these things? And Jesus answered, destroy this temple and I will raise it up in three days. 
Therefore the Jews said, this temple took 46 years to build, and will you raise it up in three days? But he, Jesus, was speaking about the temple of his body. So when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the statement Jesus had made. While he was in Jerusalem during the Passover festival, many believed in his name when they saw the signs he was doing. Jesus, however, would not entrust himself to them since he knew them all and because he did not need anyone to testify about man for he himself knew what was in man. That last part of the passage is a confusing part of the passage. We'll get to that in a few moments, but there are just really kind of three ideas that I want to talk about today as it relates to this conflict moment in the ministry of Jesus. And the first thing we see in verses 13 and following is this, Jesus cares about his house. He cares about the house of God. When he arrived in the temple, it says that he went in, the NIV says that he went into the temple courts, and when he went into the temple courts, he found them selling oxen, he found them selling sheep, he, he found them selling doves and pigeons, and why were they doing that? Can anybody tell me why they were selling those things in the temple? Anybody? Sacrifice. Sacrifices, that's exactly right. Because people were coming to Jerusalem, they were traveling from far and wide to come and to offer their sacrifices at the time of the Passover. It was a very important, a very holy, a very sacred day. Now, a lot of people use this passage to say, well, obviously they were, you know, they were selling things and they were trying to take advantage of people. And that is true. But Jesus was not upset that they were selling these things. Because honestly, when the people were traveling, and they were traveling from far and wide, like they could not bring all of their animals with them. There had to be a way for them to come and to be provided what they needed in order to do what God required from the Old Testament law. There had to be a, a process for them to get the animals, to get the things that they needed in order to offer the sacrifices. There's a, an interesting little statement in this passage that we just read of why Jesus was upset. He was not upset that they were selling the things. He was upset of where they were selling them. Because again, as the NIV says, and as different translations will tell us, they were selling it within the temple courts. Now, why is that a big deal? Well, here's, a, here's why it's a big deal. Here's why Jesus was mad. Because when the temple was built, and this was the second temple, this is Herod's temple, the reason that it upset Jesus is because when the design of the temple itself, there was an outer section of the temple that was called the court of the Gentiles. And then they would pass through the court of the Gentiles and only, you know, the only people who could pass through there and go lay further were, were the people who were the people of God. The Israelites are the only ones that could move forward, the Jewish people going forward. And so outside is the court of Gentiles. The court of Gentiles is a place where anyone who is not Jewish or anyone who is not in the faith, that's where they could gather together and they could come into that place. But when you move beyond the court of the Gentiles into what was then called the court of the women... That was a place that only the Jewish women could go and the men could pass through there as well, but that was a, a sacred place and that's where they would go and they would pray. And that's where they would pray for God to bring healing. That's where they would pray for God to bring forgiveness. That's where they would pray to experience the presence and the power of God in that place because that's exactly what the temple was built for was to experience the presence of God because that's where God resided. And so the outer courts, the court of the Gentiles, that's where the, where the Gentiles prayed. The court of women, that's where the women prayed. And then as you move further in, then the men could go into the next layer, the next area in the temple. And that's where they would pray. And then, of course, as you know, they would then go into the holy place and then the high priest only once a year to the holy of holies. And so this was a place of prayer. This was a place to encounter and experience the power and the presence of God. Jesus was upset because they were selling. They had created a marketplace in the very place that God had created and God had designed to be a place of prayer. And so we go back to this passage and it says that, that Jesus went up to the temple. When he arrived in the temple, he found people selling oxen and sheep and doves. And he also found the money changers sitting there. And after making a whip out of cords, he drove everyone out of the temple with their sheep and oxen. Now, we've all seen the pictures, with, you know, the paintings that people have done of, of Jesus with a whip and going around and like hitting people with the whip and like going crazy. And the, that's not really what happened. That whip that he made was not a, something that he hit people with. He did not like go and violently hurt people in that moment. 
when he hold, held that whip in his hand, what it did is it spoke to his authority. In other words, if someone's coming at you with a whip, what are you going to do? You're going to listen to them, aren't you? I mean, that's just a natural thing. And so it established authority. Because again, whether this was the beginning of Jesus' ministry or whether this was towards the end of his ministry, obviously the people had a, a rhythm, they had a system, they had something they were used to, and they're sitting there inside the courts, inside the, the Gentile courts, in the court of the women, and they were selling things there. And so Jesus made that whip out of cords, which gave him authority, it gave him power, and he drove everyone out of that area, and he told them, stop doing this here because you've created at my father's house a marketplace. And we go again into Matthew or Mark and Luke and said, you've made my house, it's a house of prayer, you've made it into a den of thieves. We've read that in, in different gospels. And so Jesus clearly wanted to change the dynamic that this place was special. God cares about his house. He cares about the temple of God. Now, when we think about that, when we talk about that, obviously our minds go to like maybe this room, maybe to this place. Like, well, this is a place that obviously God wants it to be something that's special and something that's set apart. But have you ever read 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9? Can anybody tell me what that passage says? Anybody? Okay, I'll give you a hint. It says, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, right? And so the picture that we're getting here and the, the thing that Jesus is laying out here is he's talking about the temple, the presence of God. At that time, it was a structure. In this time, after Jesus rose from the grave, it's you and me. And I know that is true because if we continue reading this passage after we read in that first part of the passage that Jesus cares about his house, and the second part that I wanted to point out today is that the purpose of his house is to point to his work. It's to point to the work that Christ is doing. Look what it says in verse 17. It says, and his disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. That's an Old Testament reference back to um, Psalm 60, 69. Psalm 69. It's a reference back to that passage. And it says, so the Jews replied to him, what sign will you show us for doing these things? Everybody wanted signs back in that day. Why? Because they wanted to know under what authority the person was speaking, right? So in the previous passage we just read, he made a whip out of cords, which gave him authority. Now he is saying, you've made my house into a den of thieves. You have created a marketplace in the place that God wanted to be for prayer. And so now they're saying, so what sign will you show us for doing these things? Jesus answered, verse 19, destroy this temple and I will raise it up in three days. I will raise it up in three days. Now listen, they're, they're laughing at him now. They're mocking him now because it goes on to say, uh, the Jews said, this temple took 46 years to build and you're going to build it back in three days? Now, obviously we know what Jesus is talking about, right? We get it. But actually, God's word lays it out even more clearly. It says this, but Jesus was speaking about the temple of his body. And so I know that what I said a few moments ago about what God has set apart as holy to experience the power and the presence of God, that at that time it was a structure, and at this time, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? That your body is that temple that experiences, that, that is created by God to experience the power and the presence of God in this place. So Jesus was speaking of his own body. The temple will be raised in three days. Now, it went on to say, and listen to these words, but he was speaking about the temple of his body. So when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this and they believed the scriptures and the statement Jesus has made. This is a passage that oftentimes gets overlooked. This last couple of verses I just read, like people don't really pay attention, but think about what I just read. It says, after Jesus was raised from the grave, they remembered that Jesus said that he would raise this temple back up in three days. So then they believed in the scriptures and then they believed in his word. In other words, they're still looking for the sign. They were 
Obviously, they were disciples, so they're following him. Like they're walking behind him. And I think the disciples listed here is not necessarily referencing the Peter and the James and the Johns. I think it's like disciple is the word follower. I think it's other people that were following him uh, throughout his ministry. And they were so astonished and so amazed at what he had to say. And so were shocked at the fact that he was healing and raising people from the dead. That they just kept following him. And they were amazed at what he was doing. They were not amazed at who he claimed to be. You see, they knew that he was doing all of these miracles. They knew that he was a prophet. They knew he was something special, but they didn't necessarily believe that he was the son of God. Does that sound like maybe what we live in this world today? Where people are shocked and they're amazed at, at all of the things that are happening. And maybe, you know, they're showing up in churches. We talked about it last week when, uh, from Matthew chapter 7. That they're, they're seeing like the work of God and they're, they're, they're celebrating. They're, they're singing the songs and they're, they're celebrating all who God is. But yet they're in it for the emotion of following God. They're in it for the, 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 the wow factor of following God. But when it really comes to this idea of believing that Jesus is the Son of God and that he came to this earth to pay the debt of your sins and that we have a duty and a responsibility to not only believe that Jesus has done that, but then to turn from our sin and to follow him, to give our lives, lay our lives down for the purposes of following after him, new creation, all the old has passed away and everything is made new. Like that's the part where it's like, yeah, I'm not sure I'm willing to do that. You see, what clearly Jesus was teaching us in this moment of conflict in the statement that he was making in this moment is this. is like, hey, the purpose of this house is to point people to what he's done. And that's kind of like what our responsibility and our job is. Matthew chapter 28, Mark chapter 16, Acts chapter 1. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Make disciples of all the nations. Go to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth. Show people who Christ is by the way that you live. Because don't you know that even your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? Jesus cleansed the temple. He walked through the temple with a, a whip in his hands and he made them run out of that place. He turned over tables and that was in a violent way where money was spilling and rolling all over the, the floor. Yeah, he did all of that. Why? Because he wanted to change the temple into what he intended for it to be. And that's exactly what Jesus wants to do in us when we make the decision to believe that he is the son of God, that he died and that he rose again, to trust him in him as our Lord and Savior. He wants to change us into what he intends for us to be. And that is the purpose of his work. But then we see the third part of this passage. The third part of this passage is this, is believing in his work is different than believing in him. Believing in like what he has done is not nearly as important as believing in him. Verses 23 and 20 through 25. While he was in Jerusalem during the Passover festival, many believed in his name when they saw the signs he was doing. Jesus, however, would not entrust himself to them since he knew them all and because he did not need anyone to testify about man for he himself knew what was in man. Now, what this passage points to is the tragic situation that we still experience today is that there was a recognition that Jesus was a prophet, that Jesus was special, that Jesus was someone to listen to, that Jesus was even someone to emulate but yet denying the fact that Jesus is God. Denying the fact that he is God. And that's what we see in this passage. That's why when it says, while he was in Jerusalem during that Passover, many people believed in him because they saw what he was doing. They were showing up and they were moved and they were astonished and they were amazed when he was healing the sick and raising the dead. They were shocked when he would do the things that he did. It's like, man, this is, some, I want to follow after him. Man, I want to be in the room when this is happening. But they were only there for the work. They were not there for him. And I got to be honest with you. I think probably that's still true in a lot of churches today. 
where people are there for the excitement and they're there maybe for the music and they're there for maybe the programs. We heard the special, you know, incredible testimony of uh, even the iKids program, wonderful ministry of, of what God is doing through our great team there and, and how God is ministering to family. Like, that's awesome. But I'm not saying this about you, but, but there would be people who might even show up for something like that. And like, yeah, man, I want to, because this is awesome. But as awesome as all the programs are, as awesome as the Awana program is, as awesome as the music, as awesome as the iKids, as awesome as the, the nursery and, the, and the, the sports leagues and, and all of the things that are done, as awesome as that stuff is, that is not the end game. That's not where we're supposed to land. That's not why we're here. We're here to encounter a holy God, to believe that he is the Son of God who came to take away the sins of the world. And so Jesus, as he walked into the temple that day, he was, he was heartbroken because he saw this place that, that God had intended to be a place where people would come and encounter the very real, powerful, one and only God, a place that was holy, a place where we were to experience the power and the presence of God, and yet they had turned it into a shopping mall. Now here we are today. While in that day, the temple was the place that God had intended for us to experience the power and the presence of God, today it's you. And so the question is this, is what have you turned your life into? Today, if Jesus showed up, and if he walked into your house, if he came and found you today, and that he had the opportunity of interacting with you, and again, if we go back to scripture and we know that, that when he sees you, as he looks at you as the temple of the Holy Spirit, is he going to respond in a way where he's picking up the whip? Or is he going to respond in a way where he says, well done? You see, that's the picture of how Jesus used a moment of conflict to teach us on how he wants us to live. And so a quick couple of points of, of application for us today from, from this passage. The first one is this. Always recognize the importance of the house of God. Now, again, obviously, there's a practical element of that, of course, the house of God, this place, you know. Hey, yeah, this is a special place, but this is just a building. This is a building that people built with concrete and blocks and, and, and carpet and paint. And, and it's nice and it's awesome and we love to be here. This is not the house of God. You are. Recognize the importance of the temple. That it's a special and a holy and a powerful place where we're to encounter the presence of God. So recognize the importance of the house of God. The second thing, dig deeper into the present work of Jesus in your life and in the world. Like, don't just simply sit back and get involved in the emotion of the moment. Man, we saw a couple of weeks ago what was happening at Asbury. Man, great, great stuff. I mean, obviously, God was doing a great work there. And, I mean, it was, it was just a... It's awesome to hear about and awesome to talk about. And we say, God, you know, do it here. God, we want that to, to, to happen here. But do you know they actually had to, to shut that down, that, the events that were taken? They had to shut it down because in that small little town, in that small little place, over 50,000 people flocked to that building, coming from all over the world to be in that place. Why? Because they wanted to come and see. And while I get it and I understand it and I'm not against it, in a way I sit back and think, we don't need to go to a building in Kentucky to experience the power and the presence of God because today he is alive within us. Wouldn't it be great if we could experience the power and presence of God like in our own lives and not have to go see a show? Like that to me is what we've got to do. Dig deeper in our personal relationship and the present work of Christ in our lives and in the world. And third thing, hey, fixing your eyes on Jesus as savior of the world will keep you from being fixated on working your way to heaven. If you recognize Jesus for who he is, that he is the savior of the world who came and who died and who was buried and who rose again and through him and him alone we find salvation. If we know that 
And if we know that he's the only way, the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him, man, it takes the weight and the burden off of our shoulders of trying to figure out how we can guarantee we're going to get to heaven. Because it's not up to you. It was all up to him. It's not about what you can do. It's about what he did. It's not about how good you might be. It's about how holy and perfect our God is. And so recognize, understand, man, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so let's live our lives in relation to that, in connection to that, and in recognition of that truth. And let's live our lives like that every single day so we can experience the power and the presence of a holy God who is in a holy place, not in a temple in Jerusalem, but alive in you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word that, uh, Lord, clearly teaches us and guides us, instructs us, but also encourages us. God, I'm so encouraged today that I don't have to travel to, you know, a hilltop in Jerusalem to experience your presence. We can do it right here, right now. God, that you are alive in each of us. And God, we're so grateful for the, the fact that that's true. Grateful that through trusting in Jesus, that the Holy Spirit is a, a, always doing a present work in our lives. God, we are, we're, we're amazed. We're, we're not worthy. We don't understand it. But God, we're grateful that you've done it. And I pray right now for every person in this room, if there's someone here who is not, God, I pray that in this moment they'll make that decision, that they'll trust you and believe in you. God, I pray for all of us that we will recognize the importance of the temple. God, that we would get it, that we would understand it. God, that we would treat it as you intend for us to treat it, as a holy and a sacred place where you reside. Thank you, God, for allowing us to be a part of this incredible picture that you've painted. With their heads bowed, with their eyes closed, our team is here. Man, I want to encourage you if you're here today. And, and, and if you don't know, like that you know, that you know, that you know that Jesus is the Son of God, that he died and that he rose again, if maybe you have been walking through life and amazed at what he's done and astonished at what we say and what you hear, but yet you've never had that personal encounter with Christ, as Grayson talked about a few moments ago from the baptistry of this dear lady who made a decision to trust fully. If you've never done that, like, man, make this the day. Last week, we had 46 people who made that decision that we know of, that like came down forward and wrote cards and gave us their names and we've contacted many more that, that we didn't have the opportunity, but we pray that we will. Like, God did an incredible work last week, but hey, listen, God does an incredible work every day. And today might be your day. And so if you're here and you've never made that decision, man, I, we're going to stand in a moment. We're going to sing together. And when we do, I'm just going to encourage you to make your way to the front. Talk with one of our team members here and just say, I want to meet Jesus. Maybe you want to come and kneel here and pray. Maybe you want to come down and just say, God, I have not treated your temple the way that I should. I want to change that today. God, I confess I have not treated your temple in the way that you've intended for me to treat it. So God, today I, I'm going to change it. Maybe you want to come and join our church family. Maybe you want to come and, and talk about baptism. Well, whatever it is, like we're going to stand right now. Go ahead and stand. We're going to sing together. Charles is going to lead us. And I just encourage you to step out and make this altar a place of prayer today. Charles, lead us. I hear the Savior say, thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. God, today we thank you for your word. We thank you for its encouragement. God, we thank you for its wisdom. God, I pray you give us the courage, the strength to live by it. As we leave this place today, God, that you would help us to walk out of here recognizing you gave us your perfect word so that we would know how to live. Lord, help us to do so today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Before you move, before you move, our team is here. The altar's open. We'd love to talk with you. Don't forget, I want you to text the word topic to 77411 
and let us know what you'd like to talk about coming up after Easter. We've got invitation cards we want you to pick up as you leave today. And God bless you. Have a great week. We'll see you back next Sunday where we're going to continue in the book of John in Conflict Revolution. Have a great week. Thank you for worshiping with us today. We're so glad you joined us. If you prayed to receive Christ today, we'd love to hear from you. We want to help you as you begin this new journey of faith in Jesus Christ. Send an email to the address on the screen, pastor at trbc.org. Likewise, if you've never accepted God's free gift of salvation, the forgiveness of sins made possible by the death and resurrection of Jesus, but you'd like to know more, we're here to help you. Just reach out to us and we'd love to tell you more. Our mission at Thomas Road is to change our world by developing Christ followers who love God and love people. If you'd like to help us fulfill that mission by giving to our ministry, go to the link on your screen and make your contribution today. Help us help others with the life-changing truth of God's love.